Namaste to all of you. So this is the fifth session on uh, managerial economics. We have already completed four sections, and in these four blocks, we covered uh, the basic uh, concepts about managerial economics, the demand, uh, the, the demand concepts. Then we have covered the production, then cost, and finally we are onto the marketing side. So. The block four, uh, in the last uh, session also we have covered the block four, but in this session <coughs> we will try to see some of the portions uh, that we covered yesterday so as to make it full and then after we will move on to the further chapters and the further subjects. So starting from, uh, so yesterday we, we have uh, understood the concept till profit maximizing output in the short run. So uh, just uh, a, a bit, uh, I will take us some of the time to explain this now. So the graph has uh, on Y axis, the price is plotted on X axis, the quantity is demanded. Let us look at the marginal cost. The marginal cost curve goes uh, from the starts at P3, then goes down and then further it goes up. Same way, average total cost and average variable cost. So since the demand is uh, horizontal, so if anything, uh, I mean, if the demand is raised because of reducing the price, the demand will go up to the level of infinity. And if the prices uh, are increased, then the demand will become zero. So that's what the horizontal line indicates. The second aspect is how the sales are being considered in these cases. So let us see that average total cost, the curve of average total cost run above the P2 level. So at the level of price P2, we are incurring a loss. Of course, it is not as high as in comparison of P3, but at the level of P2 also we are incurring loss on the account of less than average total cost. So our profitability will only come, our profit maximizing equilibrium will only come when we touch the price level P1 at, uh, when we touch the price level P1. So even th this graph indicates that even the average variable cost uh, is uh, above the P3 level. So producing a good where the average variable cost is uh, ever is not at all desirable because that means that we are running losses on a uh, on the on a variable cost basis so that is not a feasible for our for us to run our firm but in case the um, we we can run the form p2 for a certain duration because we feel that at a point of time we can gradually raise it to the level of price so the moment uh, AVC is greater than a price level, there is no point in pursuing the production. We can pursue the production if the price is lower than the average uh, total cost curve. But the profit maximizing equilibrium can only come if we move on to the uh, price band of P1, which is equivalent to the demand demand. The second is the long run. So at this point, marginal revenue equals to LMC. LMC is our uh, long run marginal curve, marginal cost. And the firm would equally be uh, select the plant size to produce 240 units of output. So the 240 units of output is the ultimate level for us to maximize the profit. Firm would not produce 140 units of output at every cost. Uh, which is the point of LSE, at this point marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost. So since at this point the marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost, so our opti optimum results will only come when we move on to the 240, quantity 240. So economic profits attract new firms, 
into the industry whose entry increases industry supply. As a result, the prices would fall and the firms in the industry adjust their output levels in order to remain at profit maximization level. This process continue until all economic profits are eliminated. There is no longer any attraction for new firms to enter since they can only earn nominal profits. So we have already explained the characteristics of monopoly. Let us look at the graph again. So at point E, MC intersects. MC stands for marginal cost. So, so marginal cost intersects marginal revenue from below. Corresponding to E, the profit maximization equilibrium output is OQ. So that Q is the output, that is quantity. So OQ is the maximum output at the level E. At OQ output, the price is OP is equal to QR. So OP is equal to QR means, since it looks like a, uh, a square form, so OP is equal to QR is what our um, price indicates. The monopoly profits are equal to price minus average cost multiplied by output. So PCKR, so PCKR is our uh, super normal profits of the monopoly firm. So yesterday we were at this point when we have to close our session because of the time constant. So that is why I started slightly back and then I covered this portion. So perfect competition versus monopoly. So there is always a fight between a perfect competition and monopoly because perfect competition is a uh, is an area where the market commands the price and monopoly is an area where the firm commands the price. So there is always a sort of tiff going on in between the perfect competition and monopoly. So area B, C, D, if you look at the area B, C, D, area B, C, D. So we will find that represents loss of consumer surplus that accrued in the competition. The consumer surplus will be the area B, C, A, D. PCAD, PCAD, so it starts from PC, goes up to A and then D. So PCAD is an area which is indicated as consumer plus, consumer surplus. As indicated, price would be PM and quantity would be QD. Notice that the monopolist will charge a higher price and produce a lower quantity as expected. The consumer surplus is reduced to PMAB. So PMAB is just above uh, the PCD line. So the consumer, uh, the rectangle PC, PM, BC that was part of consumer surplus under competition is now economic profit for the monopolist. So what it indicates that initially the entire uh, rectangular, uh, the entire uh, triangular part of PCAD was part of a consumer surplus. But because of a monopoly, certain portion of consumer surplus has gone to the firm account. So now the consumer has been left with a, in a monopoly situation, the consumer has been left with a low amount of surplus. And the firm will even try to capture those surplus which are available with the consumer. So mono price, uh, monopoly price will generally be greater than marginal cost and the firm is able to generate super normal profits. Key conditions that give rise to monopolies are economies of scale and barriers to entry. So competition also ensures that price equals long run marginal cost. Monopolist will charge prices. Absence of any competition will leave such organization wasteful and inefficient. So moving on to the pricing under monopolistic and oligopolistic competition. So um, uh, monopolistic competition. So monopolistic competition is found in the industry where there are a large number of sellers selling differentiated but close substitute product. So let us not uh, get confused from monopoly with monopolistic. Monopoly we have one uh, seller. But in monopolistic com uh, competitions, there are a large number of sellers. The characteristic features of monopolistic competition are as follows. A large number of sellers. Each seller acts independently as has no influence on others. It has a monopolistic competition as a large number of buyers. 
of a product and each buyer acts independently sufficient knowledge the buyers have a number of options available to choose from for example we have a number of petrol pumps in the city now it depends on the buyer and the ease with which he or she will get the petrol decides the location of the petrol pump here accessibility is likely to be an important factor differentiated products so differentiated products means offers differentiated products though the difference in products is marginal like toothpaste so we 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 have a toothpaste from colgate we have toothpaste from some other companies the basic contents remains the same maybe the taste or the fragrance will slightly differ free entry and exit the buyers and sellers are free to enter and exit the market nature of the demand curve the demand curve of the monopolistic competition has the following characteristics less than perfectly elastic in monopolistic competition no single firm dominates the industry and due to product differentiation the product of each firm seems to be a close substitute though not a perfect due to this the firm in question has high elasticity of demand demand curve slopes downward in monopolistic com competition say in a perfect competition the demand curve is horizontal but in a monopolistic com uh, competition the demand curve goes down why because the demand curve facing the firm slopes downward due to the varied taste and preferences of consumers so because of the varied taste and preferences of the consumers the demand curve is down so reducing the price means increasing the demand for the product and uh, uh, this implies that the demand curve is not perfectly elastic price and output determination in short run so let's look at the graph Uh, on x axis it has uh, price and cost on y axis it has quite quantity then we have a two demand curve ar and mr and uh, average revenue and marginal revenue and then marginal cost and average total cost so uh, let us explain this a bit the equilibrium point for the firm is at price p and quantity q and is denoted by point a so point a indicates that this is the equilibrium the economic profit is given as area p a q r the difference between this and the monopoly case is here the barriers to entry are low or weak and therefore new firms will be attracted to enter fresh entry will continue to enter as long as there are super normal profits price and output determination in long run so in short run we have already seen those um, uh, graphs now for the long run we can see that it is assumed that the other firms in the market are also making profits situation would attract new firms in the market the new firms may not sell the same products but will sell similar products so there will be an increase in the number of close substitutes available in the market and hence the demand curve would shift downwards since each existing firm would lose market share the entry of new firms would continue as long as there are economic profits the demand curve will continue to shift downwards till it becomes tangent to lrac at a given price p and output q so for a given price q the demand curve will continue to shift downwards and become tangent to lrac that is the basic concept of the long run equilibrium under monopolistic and oligopolistic competition oligopoly is the form of market organization in which there are few sellers of a homogeneous or differentiated product and the differentiated products are near resembling product if there are only two sellers we have a duopoly situation uh, if the product is homogeneous we have a pure oligopoly if the product is differentiated we have a differentiated oligopoly while entering entry into an oligopoly oligopolistic industry is possible oligopoly exists when transportation costs limit the market area this happens in the case of cement industry so that is why many of the cements industries are confined in one geography since only a few firms are selling homogeneous or differentiated products in oligopolistic markets the action of each firm affects the other firms in the industry and vice versa because what happens that there are very few firms let us take an example of automobile sector so automobile uh, doesn't have too many companies like 100 or 200 or 500 they have a limited company 10 12 that are working as a in the market or 15 or 20 so these these 20 firms 
follow each other. So the price of a particular size of a car goes down. Relatively, every other company will try to match that price. Or if uh, if the advertisement goes up, which is basically a non-price competition, so the firms will start doing following each other. So they are in close contact with what their competitors are doing. Why? Because number of firms are less, and the market has got uh, almost homogeneous or differentiated product, differentiated on the basis of slight variations. So they have to keep a tab on their competitor uh, so that their demands cannot be affected by a change in the competitor's behavior. So price competition can lead to ruinous price falls. So uh, if, if they start, uh, I mean, decreasing the price, a point will come when it will become uh, literally less than the cost. So less than the cost means that we'll be running into losses. So temporarily, okay, you know, one can run into loss so that in the long run they can get the benefit. But in the long run, if the same thing happens, then it is a loss to the uh, organization and subsequently the organization will be closed. So what they do, so in case the price differentiation will not be uh, a matter to be pursued thoroughly, so they fight it, their war on non-price competitions like product differentiation, advertising and services. These act as a non-price uh, parameters. Oligopoly is the most prevalent form of market organization in the manufacturing sector of most nations. Some oligopolistic industries in India are automobiles, primary aluminum. Some of these products are homogeneous. Steel, basically steel, aluminum, these are homogeneous and uh, others are slightly differentiated like automobiles, cigarettes, breakfast cereals, soaps. Since an oligopolis knows that its own actions will have a significant impact on the other oligopolis in the industry, each oligopolis must consider the possible reaction of competition. That is what we were discussing in our previous slides. Now, coming to the sources of oligopoly. So the sources of oligopoly uh, are generally the same as for monopoly. That is, economies of a scale may operate over a sufficiently large range of outputs, as to leave only a few firms supplying the entire market. Huge capital investments and specialized inputs are usually required to enter an oligopolist industry. Because producing aluminium, producing car, producing uh, steel requires a huge infrastructure setup, a huge skill set, uh, are huge machines. So this acts as a deterrent to the important natural barrier to entry. A few firms may own a patent for the exclusive right to produce a commodity. So uh, this what happens in basically the drug or pharmaceutical industry. Established firms may have a loyal following of customers based on product quality and service that new firms would find very difficult to manage. This is what is basically happening for the Colgate toothpaste. The Colgate toothpaste, by way of its uh, uh, becoming a part of the habit of generations, it has been widely accepted as the best product for a toothpaste. A few firms may own or control the entire supply of a raw material required in the products. Some product. The government may give a franchise to only a few firms to operate. This also happens because government restricts some part of the uh, their activity to the licensed organization. Like you cannot open so many chemical factories across the country. So it has to be limited. So the industry which has a social cost or the industry which is strategic to the defense. So the, these industries require the government permission and they are quite in few in numbers. They are not as large as like what happens in a free market. So Classification on the basis of type of product produced. So the classification is states that there are just two options, homogeneous or differentiated. Two, contrast, uh, two contrasting behavior of oligopolist arise, that is the cooperative oligopolist, where an oligopolist follows the pattern followed by rival firms. And the non-cooperative oligopolist, where the firm does not follow the pattern. Therefore, we normally have four oligopolistic market stresses two each under cooperative and two under non-cooperative. So uh, how the two under cooperative? So cooperative means 
homogeneous cooperative oligopolies then differentiated cooperative oligopolies then homogeneous non cooperative oligopolies then differentiated non cooperative oligopolies so all these structure exist in the oligopolistic model so now there is a kinked demand curve so let's see the uh, graph this this graph shows the kinked demand so now explaining it in order to explain this characteristic of price rigidity that is prices remaining stable to a great extent swiggy suggested the king demand curve model model for the oligopolies so the demand which is supposed to go on the way uh, the demand curve goes but at a particular point it king it turns the king means it get turned and the demand becomes lower or higher depending upon the situation the kink in the demand curve rises from the symmetric behavior of the firms the proponent of the hypothesis believe that competitors normally follow price decreases they show the cooperative behavior if a firm reduces the price of its products whereas they show the non cooperative behavior if a firm increases the price of its products so now let us look at the graph that is there so the graph says that there are two demands the the demand is a dd uh, the capital dd is a demand market demand and the small dd is a perceived demand curve so at the level of price p2 the demand is uh, for a quantity uh, q q21 and at the level of uh, the price p1 the demand is for a quantity q1 so p1 is the initial price of the firm operating in a non cooperative oligopolistic market structure producing q1 out, uh, units of output so at price p1 the output is p1 p is also the point of king in the demand curve and is the initial price and dd is relatively a elastic demand curve above the existing price p when the firm is operating in the non cooperative oligopolistic oligopolistic market it results in decline in sales if it changes its price to p1 so that the sale will decline so initially if if the price is increased say from p2 the price is increased to p1 so it should go like that the demand uh, the demand uh, share of the demand curve that capital dd so the demand should move on this curve like but what exactly happens that at the level of prices the demand went leftwards and it moves to the small d area so this is this this turning of demand at the level of price p1 is kinked demand curve so the demand gets twisted when the firm is operating in non cooperative oligopolistic market it results in decline in sales if it changes its price to p1 now if the firm reduces its price below p1 and say p2 the other firms operating in the market show a cooperative behavior and follow the firm the true demand curve for the oligopolistic market is dd so small d to capital d is the true demand curve so instead of the usual demand curve of the capital dd graph there is a kink and the demand curve moves from a small d to capital d at the existing price p1 Uh, this this one is the king demand curve for marginal cost one and marginal cost uh, two so here also we see that the demand gets slightly curved at the bend point now we are we move into the uh, price competition and we have to understand what what are the cartels and conditions a cartel is a market sharing and price fixing arrangement in fact the word cartel is basically used for the drug marketers so a lot of drug marketers different drug marketers come together and decide the price of their product in the way of their marketing so that is how the cartels are known in a common parlance but then in economics also the cartels are there and a cartel is a market sharing and price fixing arrangement between groups of firms that the objective of the firm is to limit competitive forces within the market the forms of cartels may differ it can be an explicit collusive agreement 
where the member firms come together and may reach a consensus regarding the price and market sharing or implicit cutter where the collusion is secretive in nature. So uh, uh, earlier I was talking about the drug lots. So they are into type of a implicit cutter where the collusion is secretive in nature. And there is an explicit uh, collusive agreement like uh, OPEC, Organization of Petrol Exporting, Exporting Countries. So they come and form a group, but they are basically cartels. So how the cartel profit maximization works? So that's a graph which shows the original demand curve as a DD. Then we have a MC, marginal cost. Uh, on uh, x-axis, we have price uh, cost, price in terms of cost. And y-axis, uh, well, sorry, we have uh, price and cost uh, on y-axis and on x-axis we have market demand. So market demand for all members of the cartel is given by DD and marginal review as MR. Cartel's marginal cost curve given by MCC is the horizontal sum of the marginal cost curves of member firms. Price is done by considering individual members of the cartel as one firm. So this is at the point where marginal revenue is greater than MCC. So normally a quota system is followed whereby each firm produces a quantity such that its marginal cost is equal to MCC. There is an incentive for the cartel as a whole to restrict output. Why? Because they, they, all, they all are working together. So if they restrict the price by, uh, if they restrict their quota of, su of supply, then what usually happens? They can command the price. They can increase the price or they can decrease the price depending upon their own interest. But what actually happens that the joint profit maximization result is good, but individual countries in order to need, uh, the moment they need money, the individual countries, they exceed the supply. They exceed the quota given to them exceeding the supply. So they are, uh, this is how the cartel profit maximization is registered. So it's till the time that uh, all the members of the cartel work in tandem and uh, work on their quota basis, they can demand a very good profit and this is known as a joint profit maximizing result. Now coming to price leadership, <clears throat> what is price leadership? So price leadership is an alternative cooperative method used to avoid tough competition. Under this method, usually one firm sets a price, another firm follows. It is quite popular in industries like cigarette industry where any firm in the oligopolistic market can act as a price leader. The firm which is highly efficient and having low cost can be a price leader of the firm, which is dominant in the market acts as a leader. Whatever the case may be, the firm which sets the price is the price leader. So price leader is, uh, uh, is a situation where the firm which is dominant in market by virtue of their share in the market dominates the price or the firm which is highly efficient, uh, highly efficient means it is technically efficient and economically efficient and having a low cost can decide the price. So the, the moment a particular firm decides the price based on their capability, all other are following this. So the person, though the firm which decides the price is known as a price leadership. So dominant price leadership and barometric price leadership. So these are the two main uh, branchated form of price leadership. So dominant price leadership is the largest firm in the industry sets the price. If the small firms do not conform to the large firm, then the price war may take place due to which small firms may not be able to survive in the market. It is more or less like a monopoly market structure. So although firms are there, although a lot of firms are there, but the dominant player decides what should be the uh, price of its product. If other firms, small firms try to uh, reduce the price, then there will be a price war and the small firms have to be wiped out. Then the second uh, area is barometric price leadership. So barometric price leadership occurs in the market where there is no dominant firm. 
So dominant firm, there is a dominant price leadership. In a situation where there is no dominant price, uh, dominant firm, then the barometric price leadership works. The firm having a good reputation in the market usually sets the price. The firm acts as a barometer and sets the price to maximize the profits. So it happens that many, uh, we, we, we have a lot of uh, companies operating in the field of uh, air travel. But the way um, uh, Air India or say um, Indigo decides the price component, everybody else follows it because they have the Indigo has the maximum market share. So Indigo can follow a dominant price leadership. Mm -hmm. Same way, uh, the barometric price leadership all, is also followed in a way that Air India can also, although not uh, uh, being a market leader in the airline industry, but it also decides the fare. And all other firms usually follow it because it has worked a good brand and a, a good reputation in the market. So now we are moving on to the pricing strategies of Block 4. How should a product be priced? So that's most important thing. So economists are good that the level of demand for a product at any price is the sum of all what all individual consumers in the market would be willing to purchase. And this is what we have seen in our demand uh, analysis chapters also. So this demand or willingness to pay for any product is affected by three key factors. Individual's preferences for the different characteristics of the product, the price of close substitutes, and the price of goods that must be used in conjunction with it. So price of complements, price of substitutes, the level of each individual's consumer income. So these are the factors responsible for determining the price. So once a determination of price is there, let us understand what are the Herfindahl index, contestable markets, concentration ratios. So how, how it explains the market. The degree by which an industry is dominated by a few large firms is measured by concentration ratios. The four firm concentration ratio for most manufacturing industry in the United States is between 20 and 80 percent. Another method of estimating the degree of constant, uh, concentration in an industry is the Herfindahl index edge. See basically in all the management uh, theories and postulations the Americans have done a great deal of research into this. So uh, all, of, all of the concepts have got more American example than in Indian context because Indians are now doing the same level of research which Americans have done quite a few years back. So that is why in many of the cases the examples do come from the US side. So uh, this edge is given by the sum of the squared values of the market shares of all the firms in India. The higher the Herfindahl index, the greater is the degree of concentration in the industry. Suppose if one firm is working, so uh, if one firm is working, then it is 101, 101. So 101 uh, gets a squared means what? 101 into 101, so it gets 10,000. So same way, the concentration of a firm is high, whereas if Two firms are there, so one firm has got 90% share, another has got 10% share. So that is how. So then we, if we find it out, we find we will find that the concentration will be less in comparison to the concentration where that your single firm is operating. According to the theory of contestable markets developed during 1980s, even if an industry has a single firm monopoly or only a few firms oligopoly, it would still operate as if it were perfectly competent if entry is absolutely free. If other firms can enter the industry and face exactly the same cost as existing firms, and if exit is entirely cost-based, if there are no sunk costs so that the firm can exit the industry without facing any loss of capital. So contestable market, uh, you can say that uh, opening of airports. See, uh, we, we in India also, we have opened so many new airports coming up. So the um, uh, private airlines are fixing their flights, say from uh, Jaipur to, um, uh, uh, we can take an example of a 
lower area from Jaipur to Darbhanga or from Jaipur to Madhubani. So the flight which goes from Jaipur to uh, Darbhanga in Bihar is a flight operated by a private operator. So any time it can come up in the picture. So it doesn't have to do investments in the sense that it has to build a infrastructure for operating a flight because every other things has been taken care by the airport authority of India. So they have to schedule their flight from uh, Jaipur to Darbhanga. So now what happens that scheduling a flight which, which runs from Jaipur to Darbhanga is easy because at any point of time they can schedule the flight looking at the time slot and if the uh, if that route is not viable for them economically not viable for them then they can at any point of time they can withdraw their flight from it so the type of market in which it is easy to enter and simultaneously easy to exit is basically a contestable market Moving on to price discrimination, in an economic jargon, price discrimination is usually termed monopoly price discrimination. This level is appropriate because price discrimination cannot happen in a perfectly competitive industry in equilibrium. Monopoly power must be present in a market for price discrimination to exist. There are three types of price discrimination. First degree price discrimination, second degree, third degree price discrimination. So for what is first degree price discrimination? First degree price discrimination refers to a situation where the monopolist charges a different price for different units of output according to the willingness to pay of the consumer. Under first degree price discrimination, the full benefit from the trade between buyer and seller accrues to the seller. One strategy to achieve First degree price discrimination is to sell to the highest bidders through sealed bid auctions. So bidding, auctioning is one part of the strategy to follow first degree price discrimination. Then second degree price discrimination refers to a situation where the monopolist charges different prices for different set of units of the same product. So this form of price discrimination which is based on the volume of consumer purchases so like we, we have also seen in a lot of things that if we purchase five soaps at a time, we do not have to pay the individual, the price of an individual shop soap multiplied by five. So definitely we are going to get discounts. So in one purchase, the discount is factor is there. So this is how the second degree price discrimination works. So uh, this form of price discrimination, which is based on the volume of consumer purchases, is known as second degree. Second degree price discrimination is also referred to as multi-part pricing. So you have uh, prices for one part. Suppose if one buys a, um, uh, say, um, a soap, a soap, uh, one soap, then he has to pay one price. If he buys five, he has to pay a different price. If he buys uh, say a hundred because he's a retailer, so his requirement is more so then his his price will also be a different price. So when the monopolist firm divides the market for its product into two or more markets, groups of buyers or segments, and charges different price in each market, it is known as a third degree price discrimination. So third degree price discrimination means what? The customers are segregated of the same product. Suppose uh, uh, they are in the airline industry and uh, uh, the ticket's prices might be changed as per the age of the customer or profile of the customer. Suppose for a senior Swedish citizen, we will be charging less. For a student, we will be charging again lesser than the senior citizen. But for a working professional or a businessman, the charges will be more. For the same product, we have what we did with divided our customer segments into different parts and based on the type of the customer segments, we are charging the price. So pricing based on what type of consumer is doing the purchasing rather than the volume of purchase is an approach known as third degree price discrimination. So second degree is based on volume 
the third degree is based on type of consumer and first degree is based on where the seller gets the maximum uh, uh, benefit so the best uh, option for a first degree price discrimination is the auction or bid so second degree price discrimination we have a graph uh, on y axis the price is there on x axis the um, quantity is there q1 q2 q3 we have a price band also p2 and p1 and uh, we have a demand curve uh, which starts at the level slightly ahead of price p1 and it's a, uh, it's a regular demand curve so let us see how it works suppose that the firm sets a price of p1 for the first q1 units purchased and that additional units sell for p2 a two estate pricing scheme the consumer buys q1 units at price p1 and q2 units at price p2 that portion of the consumer surplus labeled as p1 bc p2 p1 bc p2 this uh, black uh, part of the graph is known as a consumer surplus and is now captured by the firm this is still leaves a rather large portion of the consumer surplus is still in the consumer hands so above than that p1 b uh, from say price written as a price so p1 b is one area where the consumer surplus is still there peak load pricing so what is peak load pricing peak load pricing is a type of third degree price discrimination in which the discrimination basis is temporal whenever price discrimination is based on time differentials the object of the selling firm is to charge a higher price for the product during the more inelastic period and a lower price during the more elastic interval so this happened in hotel booking initially when the mobile phone came to our country in use so we we have found that during the night time the charges were less during the day time the charges were more now of course these things have changed the concept of uh, working has changed but this used to happen even today we can also find that um, airline booking is basically based on dynamic pricing system so when there is a peak load time the prices will be more when there is a uh, less demand for the airline ticket the prices will be less this applies for the hotel booking also so that means that object of the selling firm is to charge a higher price for the product during the more inelastic and lower price during the elastic period now what is bundling so bundling is the practice of selling two or more separate products together for a bundling is the practice of selling two or more separate products together for a single price that is bundling bundling takes place when goods or services which could be sold separately are sold as a package many a times we have consumed uh, we have purchased the consumer goods uh, like fridge so it comes with a service warranty of say one years one year free service or two years free service or it will uh, add some cost and it will give a 3 or 5 year service same way same way it happens for the uh, acs also so this is how the bundling is done so a codification of bundling practices and definition of selling strategy is pure bundling only products are sold as bundles mixed bundling products are sold both separately and as a bundle and tying is the purchase of the main product tying product requires the purchase of another product tied product which is generally an additional complementary product so bundling can be good for consumers it can reduce search cost the bundled goods are in the same place as well as the producer's distribution cost because if the producer has to sell both the products on a different platform so definitely he has to incur more cost in in, in terms of uh, placement of product in terms of identifying the market for it 
and saying it is selling it in a bundle product requires a lesser effort and a less cost so there are lower transaction costs because a single purchase is cheaper to carry out than the multiple purchases and that is why we have seen that lot of bundling are happening happening uh, across the retail market and the producer may be a more efficient bundler than the customer two part tariffs so what is two part tariff the fee for privilege of service plus prices of for services consumed is called a two part tariff one of their technique requires buyers to pay a fee for the right to purchase their product and then to pay a regular price per unit of the product so initially you have to pay one amount of the money and gradually since you are using you have to pay a different amount of money so this happens in uh, many of the industry so even uh, we can we can look at the disney world concepts there is a pricing system so uh, if, if you uh, just if you want to enter it you have to pay a more uh, a high a high revenue just to enter the disney park <coughs> a different revenue when you want to avail all the rights that are available in the disney and why this happens because the disney world has got its own monopoly a local monopoly and that is why people flock to it so once people flock to it it knows that it has got a captive customer base so it can charge on a different basis so two tariff is what entry uh, at the point of entry there is one tariff and at subsequent use there is another tariff then we have a pricing of joint products products can be related in production as well as in demand the process of producing leather shoes and handbags in a leather factory is a good example of fixed proportions in production so it basically happens that uh, from one of the raw material we can have a multiple products so the products uh, in the form they form a leather we can manufacture the shoe we can manufacture the handbags we can go for any type of leather cover which is required so what usually happens that producing these two on a different platform will be a costly effort so the producer what it does the same producer which produces the shoe produces the handbags also so they just have to refix the machine so the processors of the machine has to be refixed and the new product will come into the oven and what what basically happens and in some part of the uh, form Until a certain process will be the same for both of it. Thereafter, there there will be change. So if they rearrange their uh, processes in a manner that they can produce shoes also and they can produce handbags also. So the cost uh, of producing in a different setup will be more in comparison to what a producer who is jointly producing the thing gets. So being a cheaper option. Uh, It, it is good for them and that is how the producer does it then we have at uh, transfer pricing so transfer pricing is setting the price for goods that are sold between these the related legal entities branches subsidiary etc transactions covered under transfer pricing are sale of finished goods purchase of raw material it enabled services purchase of fixed assets sale or purchase of machinery etc so these are transfer pricing so what usually happens that you purchase some part from the another firm uh, uh, assemble it uh, as a sub part to your main part and then sell your main part so this is how the transfer pricing is done so what is the purpose of transfer pricing profits of different units can be ascertained separately and this helps in separate performance evaluation of each unit of an organization transfer pricing also impact resource allocation among different units of an organization then uh, coming to the last portion of our pricing strategies we have already covered uh, the pricing strategies in detail in terms of perfect competition monopoly which are two different trends of the market 
in terms of uh, monopolistic competition in terms of oligopolistic competition we have seen how the price is premium comes in a short run as well as in long run and uh, we have also tried to understand that how the market concentration works how the contestable markets will be what are the price discriminations so together combine these things uh, in the form of a uh, knowledge about the market and its price mechanism a managerial economist has a uh, very good command on determining the price and the market and the type of segment that he wants to uh, sell his product to uh, will be uh, a great help to the uh, manager so there are many ways to determine the price and there are some other ways also which is known as a other pricing practices so pricing is a very um, a very varied subject which depends not only on the cost it depends upon the demand also it depends upon the competition also it depends upon the uh, type of production also so many many factors affect the price overall the price uh, overall the price depends upon the cost so the basic format might be this but then the practices are different with variations so prestige pricing is one of the important concept so what is prestige pricing prestige pricing is a type of pricing strategy where a product is placed at a higher price because consumers associate higher price with higher quality so many of the firms what they do they operate on a different segments of customer so they they have an hni plant type activity so if you go for the handbags the michael kors handbag is more uh, costly handbag as far as the industry is concerned and why people buy it because it is attached with the prestige the one who owns it feels that he is owning something which is worth it so that is how this was so this is known as a prestige pricing nike is one of the best examples of prestige pricing then we have a price scheming so what is price scheming it is a strategy where a company charges high prices from consumers at first and on substantial profits later reduces the price gradually to attract other customers who are price sensitive so initially they will charge huge amount but gradually they start charging less to add on the customer so apple is the best example because whenever a new iphone or an ipad comes into the market or mac pro comes into the market so they are charged on a very high basis but subsequently uh in addition to sell more units the charges are uh, the charges are reduced by way of offering discounts which might be a huge discount also which might be a minor discount also so in the form of discount the prices are reduced so why it is reduced it is reduced because to attract new customers so apple is the best example of this type of pricing then we have a penetration penetration pricing so the companies charge relatively lower prices for their product to attract customers and increase market share this pricing strategy is to lure customers away from competitors product so if, uh, the new companies which come in the market or the new player which comes in the market what they do for the same type of product homogeneous or slightly differentiated they charges less so the already established customer of a particular brand then moves on to the uh, new company or the new entrant why because it is charging less for the same product that they are consuming from a, their existing company so luring the customer uh, to their firm is is a type of penetrating the other customers uh, other companies customers segment so this is known as a penetrating pricing so penetrating pricing is basically lowering the price then we have a psychological pricing so 
psychological pricing involves pricing that has impact on the psychology of the consumers. So companies set prices such as rupees 499, 599, 799, 1012. So, so actually what happens that it's, uh, making it to look like a 500 rupees if you are charging say 491. So it's just a discount of 9 rupees. But then it looks in the bracket of 4, not in the bracket of 5. So this is a psychological pricing just to attract the customer. So basically the pricing is there to attract the customer to the company's fold. So we, we have entered the block four, where the price under perfect competition, monopoly, pricing strategies, how the things have to work in the market is explained. And uh, uh, these four blocks uh, will give a sufficient idea to all of you uh, to understand the microeconomic theory being applied uh, to run your firm in the market. So uh, having a knowledge of managerial economics will help us to understand the demand, will help us to understand the pricing mechanism, will help us to understand the production, the cost, will, will help us to understand the many concepts associated with these, how the elasticity of demand will affect or the price elasticity of demand will affect the uh, demand for uh, products. So if if we are into these issues and if we have to understand the, these important issues of a company perspective, we have to have a knowledge of managerial economics. The managerial economics will help us in having a broader um, uh, knowledge about the economic issues, in part GDP also, in part taxation also, in part uh, uh, changing government laws also in part initiatives from given by the government also. Likewise, uh, nowadays the government gives a lot of uh, uh, nowadays the government gives a lot of uh, initiatives for startups. So, um, if if we are into knowledge of these initiatives of the government, we can use the those part for the benefit of our, our firm and thereby we can in, increase the revenue for our company. So the basic purpose of the entire managerial economics is to make the managers aware about the importance of economics to their managerial behavior and based on the knowledge of economics, how the um, products, price, demand, production, supply, cost, etc. will be taken care of. The second uh, the important thing about the managerial economics is that it gives us a fairly good amount of idea about our uh, country's economy also because if we know that the per capita income of a particular place is not up to the mark, so we cannot open a shop there. See, we a lot of uh, um, high brand uh, products are coming into the market. So if uh, I was talking about the Michael Kors uh, handbags, so it costs nothing less than say 50,000, 60,000 or 20,000. We cannot open these uh, type of firms in an area where there is a um, lower middle class people uh, are living because you cannot have a buyer in that area. So the per capita income also plays an important role in considering our uh, managerial uh, ability and this will help us in deciding our uh, goals and our how to target the segments of the market also. The second aspect is the major uh, economic like GDP, the government taxations. If you are, if you are into a cement factory and we know that the government has given a huge rebate 
in the form of EMI or interest, uh, in the form of interest on EMI. So we know that immediately a lot of people will move from the rented uh, position to a owner position, and the demand will increase for their uh, uh, housing. So in the moment the demand for housing will increase, there will be a demand for cement. Same way, if the firm knows that a lot of uh, infrastructure activities are going to come up, so it can have its cement uh, backs will be ready so that whenever the demand comes. So that's how the uh, managerial economics work, and uh, this helps a lot in our. Uh, study. I hope I have covered uh, the entire things in these five sessions. And uh, with this, I end the session. Thanks to all of you for listening.